Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's event, a masterclass with Sabira Earth Merchant. As we drift through the year 2020, we see that it has not been very kind to us. The last four months have left us stranded in our houses and our lives have been disrupted like never before. The entire bedrock of our economy has been left tattered and everything, including education, health and our mental state stands affected. Today, as we come together for another augmentative workshop, I would like to express my gratitude to our chairperson, Dr. Arti Gupta, for cruising us through this entire period with such meticulousness. Sitting at home, the year 2021 has emerged as a power pack year for Fiki Flow Kanpur, and Arti has made sure that we make the most of it. She has churned out illustrious workshops, talks, and webinars from a host of subjects to leave us in awe every time. Thank you, Arti, for taking up such prudent subject matters and leaving avant garde. As we get set to welcome Ms. Sabira Merchant, let's get a little more acquainted with her. Ms. Merchant graduated in liberal arts from Switzerland and has been training Femina Miss Indias and Mr. Indias to successfully represent our country at various international pageants. Sabira is primarily a stage actress, a diction expert, and also a connoisseur of art and fashion. In the 70s, Sabira became very popular on the television circuit as her show, What's the Good Word, ran for a record 15 years on national television. Besides being a theater and film personality, Sabira is an expert guide on speech, diction, etiquette, grooming, stage presence, and public speaking. She has trained a whole lot of beauty contestants, including past Miss Universe, Lara Datta, Miss World Yukta Mukhi, Diana Hayden, Priyanka Chopra, and Urvashi Rautela. The male pageants too have witnessed her students putting up a fabulous performance like Aryan Ved and Raghu Mukherjee. We thank Flo Kanpur for giving us an interface with this charming, age-defying trainer and giving us an opportunity to sort up our public speaking and international dressing. I now invite our chairperson, Dr. Arti Gupta, to make a welcome address. Over to you, Arti. Thank you, Shini. And you rightly said, personal growth is to see each moment, each person, each challenge, and each adversity as an opportunity to embrace more of yourself and the world around you. And I'm so glad that all of us members has, have seized this opportunity. A very good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome. Ms. Merchant, we are extremely grateful to you to, to have you join us and take us through this masterclass with some tips and suggestions on improving our communication and personal grooming. As Kristen Dior famously said, Grooming is the secret of real elegance. The best clothes, the most wonderful jewels, the most glamorous beauty don't count without good grooming. As adults, very often we get used to our own group and refuse to admit that we need to tweak things about us in order to evolve. The fundamental idea of Flow as an organization is to promote entrepreneurship and professional excellence through workshops and capacity building programs like these that will help all of us grow. As it is never too late to learn, to create the lasting first impression or to understand how to dress right for an occasion. Members, I'm so happy that each one of you decided to join us for this masterclass to learn from the very best. Let us together not go through life, but grow through life. I would now like to welcome Ms. Merchant, to begin the uh, masterclass. Hello, everybody. And thank you very, very much for that. So what are we going to, to learn? For Thank you. 
Oh. Uh, yes, we'll, uh, at the end of the session, we will be doing a Q&A. Okay. The session, all right. So they can have the Q&A at the end of the session, which, which is a good, uh, good thing to do. All right. So we are ready now to polish up on our communication skills. So what is the first word, which is important? The first word is clarity, C-L-A-R-I-T-Y. Clarity or clearness. Clarity first of thought, and then clarity of speech. So first, before I do anything, I have to have an orderly mind. I have to think clearly. So I have to remember in my mind, hello, I'm going to this meeting. I need to remember these points. And if I feel like I feel a lot of the times that I cannot remember all the points that I have to say, I jot them down. I keep them ready and I will tell you the best thing for you to do is to keep them ready on something which is called a Q card, a C-U-E card. Put it down on a card if it's like bullet points and if it's like three or four cards that you need, like it's 15, 20 points, then you might need about three or four cards. Keep the cards one on top of the other and try and match the cards to the color of your outfit. So for instance, if you're wearing a gray outfit, then you have a gray card with a little white paper on top of it with number one, number two, number three, number four. You refer to the points. You look at the card very adroitly and then you put the card, the first card behind it. The second card emerges. And so I have my points on a nice card or cards in my hand rather than tape. Everybody, or this goes out to all the ladies, rather than take a piece of paper which rustles in front of the mic, cur, 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 it goes like that. It doesn't look professional and the papers just flop around in the wind and the breeze. So please dispense with any kind of foolscap papers or anything like that, any sheets of papers, A4 or whatever. Take it on a QUE card to match the color of your outfit. So that's your first word, clarity, clarity of thought, clarity of speech, to remember what I say, I will put it down on cue cards, I will try and match the cue cards to the color of my outfit, I will put bullet points on, on the cue cards and then remember to look at the audience and relate to the audience when you are speaking because that is also one of the big points that is coming up now, to keep looking at the audience or keep looking at 10 people or keep looking at 100 people. No matter what the number of people are, you have to keep looking at them and refer to them and then look at your little card and then look back at them. So that's the first point. The second point is speed. So what is speed about? Hello, speed is about how fast or how slow you are. And who is to judge the speed at which you are speaking? You, who else is going to do it? You have to judge, you have to say to yourself, all right, here I am in this room, there are about 50 women, so I can't afford to be too fast because all their levels of understanding are different. How can 50 women have the same level of understanding? So they think on a different level. So I have to speak slowly. I have to match my speed to their thought process. So I should never be too fast. Otherwise the words are going to miss them. They're not going to understand what you are saying. So how slow should you be or how fast you should be depends on you, A, and depends on B, the audience. If you have three people and you're in someone's office and you're discussing, say, a project or a charity thing for Kanpur, something like that, okay, we're just going to discuss what happens with the boss of this company, four ladies go and visit him, then you can afford to be a little faster because there are four people in that room. 
So it's you who are going to judge. And ladies here, I would also like to tell you that if you are visiting anybody's office, do not put your handbags on anybody's table. Put your handbags behind you. Even at the dining table, I mean, one of the things I teach is fine dining, not that we're doing it today, but one of the points in fine dining is that you take the handbag and you put it behind you. A lot of people put it on the table because it's a status symbol. Hello, I have the latest Christian Dior, so have a look at it. No, that is totally wrong. Put it behind you. Do not let it hang on, on the handle of the chair. Do not let it hang on the rear part of the chair, but put it neatly behind the back of the chair and your rear end. So it stays behind you hidden. And do not, this is not to be part of the communication skills, but please do not use your cell phones when you go to someone's office. Put your cell phones on silent, put it away in your handbag. Later on, when you leave, you can put the phone on. What is so important in the cell phone that you can't do without it for half an hour or 40 minutes? So please do not be so dependent on your phones and do not put your phone certainly on the dining table when you sit and have your lunch or dinner in front of friends. Put it away on a silent mode. You know, in some restaurants abroad, very, very fancy restaurants, and there was one fancy restaurant here in Bombay where they had a scrambler. Now, what is a scrambler? Something that they put at the en entrance of the restaurant so that you do not get any network. They don't want the important clients to come spend a lot of money on the meal and then have a person on the next table speaking loudly and saying, oh, this is what you should do and this is what it costs and that kind of thing. So it's important, ladies, remember not to have the cell phone on the dining table or in anyone's office when you're visiting. All right, so that was not part of the game, but I said, had to say that to you because it was, it is so important, it's such an important point. Thank you for, for that extra bit. And the third point today is volume. Now, what does volume mean? It means how loud you are or how soft you are. So again, you have to be the judge four people in a room, you'll keep a certain volume. And if there are a hundred people in the room, 50 people in the room, you will project your voice. I am now projecting because there are a lot of people in this room. And now I've come back to my normal volume. So again, ladies, you have to be the judge of how loud or how very important piece. When you receive it in your hand, most people, I'm just pretending that this is the mic. This is a little bell that I have in my hand. This is the mic. Most people keep the mic like this when they speak. This is not the way to hold a mic. As I teach our Miss Indias, how do you hold the mic to get high fidelity, to get the best sound? You hold the mic like this. So you hold the mic with the heart of the mic, the energy, the heart of the mic right here. So you aim for that boom. You get that fantastic sound and you hear yourself at the end of the room and you say, wow, this sounds wonderful. But well, that's when you know you've hit the right notes. So remember to hold the mic at this angle, the heart of the mic towards your lips and speak right into it at this distance, not so close and not so far, but about four inches away. Fine, is that clear? I hope that's clear now, which was not really part of the, the teaching process, but I think you uh, ladies would like to know definitely about the microphone. That is why I put it in. So that's your volume point. Right, the next point is slightly more difficult to understand, 
but it's an extremely important point in English. It is enunciation. Enunciation. E-N-U-N-C-I-A-T-I-O-N. Now, what does enunciation mean? When I have my workshops, and of course, they're live workshops just until a few months ago, most people look at me in a very puzzled way and say, oh, we don't know what that means. So I tell them, of course, it is an, it's a very difficult word and it's not everybody knows the meaning of that word. Enunciation is very important in English. It doesn't exist in our Indian languages, like in Bangla or Gujarati, Hindi. There is no enunciation. So what is this very special thing about English? It's a bitten language. You bite the ends of each word. Now I am enunciating extra for you to understand. I'm finishing the Ds, the Ks, the Ls, the Ms, everything which is at the end of each word I have to bite. Now I will say one sentence to you from my book, which I've got here, with enunciation and the same sentence without enunciation, so you'll understand what I mean. So here it goes. The first thing you will need to determine in which brand and here you intend to order. Now, the same sentence, second time. The first thing you will need to determine is which brand and year you intend to order. Now, the second one was obviously the clearer one. Why? Because it was highly enunciated. Therefore, you have to bite the ends of each word in English. Now, pronunciations are so many, and if we go into that, it's going to take a very long time. So we can't go into the pronunciations, but uh, that's the next, uh, which is the next title in, our, in my uh, speech today. But it's very important for all the words that are pronounced correctly to be also enunciated correctly. So the next point for us is pronunciation. Now, it's not pronunciation, like some people say, enunciation. Think of a nun sitting right in the middle of that word. So, pronunciation is the right pronunciation we give to each word. But this is one of the commonest errors here in India, that everybody mispronounces their words. Now, what do we do about it? Well, there's nothing we can do about it but to practice. How do we practice? We listen to the BBC, which is what I'm asking you to do. Listen to the BBC television. You'll get excellent pronunciation there. And please read, because how will you do unless you read and unless you have some knowledge? Now, just take... A simple word in pronunciation like deliver. That's the right pronunciation. People pronounce it like deliver because it's written with an E. But hello, it's not pronounced with an E, it's pronounced with an I. It's deliver like an I, but it's written with an E. So why is it pronounced like an I? Don't trust me, that's the English language. It's an illogical language, but it's our language. Who has spoken to, who has learned to speak in English? Who has chosen to speak in English? You have. I can see Arti here and Shinu here and Nupur here. I can see Banjana. I can see three or four people here. All of you communicate in English, I know. Your SMSs are in English. Your emails are in English. You are speaking to me in English and you're learning to polish your English. So you must honor English by pronouncing it correctly. 
So I told you a simple word like deliver and the most mispronounced word is develop. Now, almost everybody I know says develop. We have developed the goods. Hello, it's not developed. Yes, I know it's written as D-E-V, but it's pronounced like a D-I-V. So it's develop. It's colleagues, not colleague, it's colleagues. And a very simple word, which most of you I know mispronounce, is the word plumber. It's not plumber. It's not plum, please call the plumber. It's plumber, please call the plumber. But we're so used to saying it in Hindi, ke plumber ko bulana, repair karna hai bathroom. So we keep saying it with a B, but it is not with a B. So there are many, many, many such words in, in English. For instance, just take a simple word like forehead. This is not forehead. You don't pronounce it forehead. You pronounce it forehead. F-O-R-E-H-E-A-D, it rhymes with horrid. So my forehead feels warm. So like that, I mean, I have lists and lists of words that people mispronounce. A word like almond, for instance. People say almond because there's an L there. But why is the L there? Again, don't ask me. That's English and that's your language. So we have to be very careful with pronunciations. People ask me, how do I know how to pronounce a word. So I'll tell you the easy way out, apart from coming to a workshop like this. I mean, we had an extended workshop. We would go through some difficult words or even normal words, and you would learn uh, them. A simple thing like realty, R-E-A-L-T-Y. What is realty? We're not having a give and take over here, but realty is real estate. Dealing in real estate is called dealing in realty. Now people mix it up with reality. Reality is the way things are now. The reality, the situation is that I'm speaking to you ladies, you charming ladies in this, at this moment. And realty is real estate, but people mix it up. They don't pronounce it carefully. So how do you look at pronunciation and go to Google? Simple thing, everybody has Google on their phones. It's become so easy in the old days. How did we learn? How did I learn? How did my friends learn? How did we grow up with knowing English so well? Of course, we had very good teachers in those days. We had British teachers, so we had an excellent background and we were taught English from the grassroots. But now what you can do is to look up that word on Google, press PR, and you get a pronunciation. You get a little microphone that speaks to you and tells you how to pronounce that word. So before you venture into unknown territory, and you go just, and you have a little speech, you've got some difficult words, you say that's the way to pronounce it. No, find out how to pronounce that word. Go into Google, research that word. You don't have that painful time of looking at the dictionary like we did in the old days and looking up the word phonetically and then speaking it. So you are very, very fortunate to have the Google with you, the Google uh, that you can research on. So please do that before you venture into a speech. So that is pronunciation. So we've gone through clarity, speed, volume, pronunciation, pronunciation. Now I hope everybody's understood everything so far. I see you kind of looking, looking satisfied. So I think you have understood everything so far. Shinu? Can you put your hands up if you have? Can you hear me, Shinu? No? Arti, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Merchant, we can. And everybody's taking notes. I can see it in the chat box, thumbs up coming up. Wonderful, wonderful. That's excellent going, very good. All right, so we finished pronunciation. Now we are into the next word, 
in communication skills, which is emphasis. Now, what is emphasis about? When you speak, you emphasize on certain words, on certain words, to give it importance. Like you say, I am having a wonderful time teaching you ladies. So I've emphasized on wonderful. And I hope you're having an equally, equally great time in listening. So I'm saying equally and great. If I say, I hope you're having an equally great time, it doesn't mean anything. When I emphasize it, it springs to life. So you have to emphasize in certain words. I have the most wonderful husband. He just showers me with the most beautiful gifts. <laughs> Does he really? <laughs> is the question. Oh. Yes, I'm sure he does. Yes, so emphasis is a wonderful word. You emphasize in certain words to bring them to life. Now, the next thing which is important in speech and diction and communication is ends of words and sentences. So you write that down as ends of words and sentences. And then I will tell you exactly what it means. Slightly ambiguous just to say ends of words and sentences, but I will demonstrate to you how you use it. Now, most people try and last with the same breath. You have to be very careful to take many breaths in your sentence. So a lot of people take one breath and then they try and take with that one breath, go down to the ends of the words and I've stopped because you can't hear what I'm saying. Why can't you hear what I'm saying? Because I haven't taken enough breaths. So you have to take a series of breaths, a breath to start with, a little bit of space, another breath, a little bit of space and another breath so that your last word can be heard. Like you have heard my last word. So series of breaths are what you need to take. Don't expect your speech to last on one or two breaths. Learn to take a breath at an adequate place and at a good spot when there's a comma, especially, and certainly where there's a full stop. So did we get, I hope you got the ends of words and sentences there. And we'll go to the next point, which is body language. So your body language should be absolutely correct. Is that the sequence you're showing it in or is another sequence? After body language, uh, do we have grammar? It's okay, whatever I have. So body language is very important. In fact, we just had a discussion with a school that I interacted with in Bhubaneswar a few weeks ago. And the school children uh, very, very asked me some questions, which I then answered uh, today. And one of the students there was sitting in an awkward position. By awkward, I mean that she had a leg spread out and one leg put on top of the other leg on the thigh of the other leg to be very, very comfortable. Now it's fine to be comfortable, ladies, in your home, in the quiet in, in, of your home, fine to be comfortable, but not in front of people. So your body language has to be totally alert body language, open body language. And when you sit, you take your right leg, put it behind your left leg or left ankle and let it flow. So that you see a nice two legs together other than breaking it up. So right leg behind your left, so right behind and your left angle and you see the flow. So you will be happy to do that, to use the correct body language. 
when you are in front of people, cell phone. People ask me, well, what do I do with my hands? Hello, what do you do with your hands? You use them. So I'm using them with you and then I'm putting them down. So I put it down, I hold my hand, I use my hand and I put it together. I don't on waving my hand, that becomes distracting. Most people, when they come in front of people and speak to them, have this habit of crossing their hands, locking their hands like this. Never lock your hands. Locking your hands shows that you are afraid of people. You are denying them access to you. It's not open body language, it's closed body language. So we want to show people that we are open to them, correct? So we keep our hands open, don't lock them behind either. Don't let them lock them behind your back. Don't lock them in front near your waist. Don't lock them over here like this cross. Keep them open, use your hands to explain something and then hold it back again. And when you are on stage, you cross very comfortably from the left side to the right side, look at people, be, be totally at ease. The thing is to let your body be comfortable. And how is your body going to be comfortable unless your brain commands it to be comfortable? So be easy in your brain, don't get nervous. Don't say, oh my God, what are they gonna think of me? Oh dear, what if I make a mistake? If you make a mistake, so what? Which person hasn't made a mistake? So you make a mistake, say, excuse me, and just go ahead, or just, just, just go gloss it over and go to the next word. So everybody makes a mistake, it's human. It's how you accept that mistake and make good to that mistake which makes you a better person. So that's ends of words and sentences finished. That's body language finished. Of course, if it was interactive, I know people would have wanted to ask me questions about it. Uh, different people, different mindsets have different questions. And I would of course be happy to answer them, but we do not have that today. So we have the next question, which is very important is, eye contact. So you maintain eye contact with the person you are speaking to, by which I mean you don't stare at the person because that is rude. So you look at the person, you look away from the person, you look back at the person, you maintain very good eye contact with the person or with persons. So you will then tell me, I am on stage or I am in front of many people. How is it possible to maintain eye contact with a hundred people? So I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier was to go from the left to the middle to the right and then back to the middle and the left. So you make a sweep in front of people and you maintain eye contact with everybody. So if you maintain eye contact with people in the front row or the second row of a theater, say, or if, a, uh, if, a, if a, in a little hall, if you are speaking to people, ladies are always mixing around with other ladies and we are addressing them with a club and things like that and also going to other clubs and speaking. When you look around at the back too and maintain eye contact with the whole lot of them. So you make a sweep. Eye contact is very important, especially on a one-to-one -one basis. If you're speaking with a, with a single person, you look at that person with great sincerity and look away for a little while and then look back at the person. Don't look around to see who's coming. Oh, hello, what a nice sari this lady has worn. Oh, my friend has just walked into the room. No, be alert and look at the person you are engaged with. So I hope that point was explained thoroughly. Then we have grammar. Now, this is a difficult point, perhaps the most difficult point 
other than enunciation. Grammar, English grammar is, is difficult, not easy. It's people who have learned grammar since they were babies, that it's easy to speak or English with the right grammar, but otherwise, if you are thinking in an, another language and then translating it into English, you lose grammar on the way. So try not to think in Hindi or Marathi or any other language, any language for that matter, and then translate into English. The crux here is that you should think in English. Then you probably will aim for the right grammar. Now, most people that I know have problem with enunciation, pronunciation, and grammar. These are the three difficult areas, grammar perhaps being one of the more difficult ones. So you don't, for instance, you don't say, um, me and my father will come to the party. So what should you say? My father and I will be there. Or well, my husband and I will be both pleased to attend. The children and I, the dog and I, I comes last, other people come first. That's the right grammar, I've heard it said wrong, wrong way many, 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 many times, and I'm sure you have too. And for instance, you said, don't say, uh, two years back, I visited Mumbai. Two years ago, I visited Mumbai. But two years ago, I was a chairperson of so-and-so club. Two years ago, not two years back. So there are many things in grammar that can go wrong, that do go wrong. A simple thing again is, this is a very common error, is shifted and moved. People say, I shifted from Kanpur to Ahmedabad. Totally wrong. So what should it be? Shifted is for a piece of furniture, for, for an object. You move. A person moves from X, Y place to Z place. So I moved from Nagpur or Kanpur to Kolkata. I moved, I didn't shift. So that is totally wrong. Now there are so many things in grammar. It's only when you speak that you know. So how do I improve my grammar? You'll ask me. Only way to do is again, read. You read the right grammar from a good book. Keep a book, read a page a day. That's all I'm asking you to do. Read one page a day. You don't have to read a lot and try and listen to the news. The news is most important, that you listen to the BBC or the CNN. You will hear good grammar being spent. You will learn to emulate them. Okay, now you have the next one. I hope you've written that down and you've understood what grammar was about. And now you have the word articles. What are articles? Articles are the, uh, these, those, they are all articles and they have to be used in English. It's the box the candle, the carpet, the boy, the man, the TV. All that has to be there. Or we use an apple umbrella. So when do we use, this is an important question, when do we use the and when do we use the? This is something which almost everybody that I ask does not know. So I would say 
if I ask 100 people, 95 will know, and maybe five will know when you use the and when do you use the. So I can't, of course, I'm not getting a response from you. And this uh, program works best on human response and give and take. But I will tell you when you use the, when you use the, you use the before a word that begins with a vowel. And whilst we're at it, one of the most important things in English is the pronunciation of your V and Ws. All the Vs in English are bitten. So bitten, what do I mean? My front teeth go over my lip. It's very, it's verdict. It's so, it's V's and W's All V's should be bitten. Very, very good. And all W's are wow, where, when. This is one of the most important takeaways from today's session. It's the pronunciation of your V's and W's and the particles. The and the D. So the D happens before an A, E, I, O. You, the, owl, the elephant, the, the boy, the book, the candle, the carpet. So something was do not know about, but I hope you are enriched by this little knowledge that I am throwing your way. So that's articles. The next thing is fillers. What are fillers? Really, really nasty words that come into our speech, like, uh, I mean, you see, you know, okay, the fillers. And the fillers happen almost every time a person speaks. So they start with saying, uh, this morning uh, I, um, I got up and I, uh, I went, uh, well, went to the bathroom and then um, I, uh, you know, I, uh, and then, you know, I made my breakfast and then, um, then you know, I had uh, my friend come across. Why should that happen? Why should the fillers happen? And why do the fillers happen? The fillers happen because you cannot think of the name. Vocabulary is not there. So you're giving yourself time to think. If I say, uh, then the next word will come to my mind. I um, went to the uh, party and then I, um, please dispense with the uhs, the you knows, you see, I mean, all these fillers that happen and almost everybody gets into the habit of using fillers. So please dispense with them, tighten your vocabulary as you can. So the name of the game, you'll tell, you'll tell me at the end of the session that Sabira spoke about uh, the mistakes that people make while speaking in English, but how do I go ahead? How do I improve myself? I improve myself by reading. This is again what I tell by Miss India's girls, ladies that come from simple little cities, sometimes small little towns, the exposure is not that much. And they, they come to a big city like, like Mumbai, exposed to so much. 
So I tell them, listen to the news whilst you're brushing your teeth. Don't listen to music. I know it's very listen to the pop songs and stuff like that. Dispense with that. Put the news behind you in the background. You absorb three words. You absorb two words. You absorbed words. You have learned words. You will use those words. And look at the way they open their mouths, those newscasters, so beautifully. There is not a single word that you will miss. And to take the newspaper, I'm telling you the same thing I tell them, because that's how you can improve. Tear that piece of newspaper out, squeeze it and put it in your handbag. Take it out when you're in the taxi, in your car, at a meeting when you have a few minutes, read from the paper. I know it's difficult to take a whole newspaper, so I'm not even telling you to do that, but tear a little piece out and put it in your bag, read it, and you will see, you'll enhance your by two words a day. That's brilliant. Please do that. So increase your vocabulary, but you don't have any fillers. Now the next word is humor. You should have a little humor in your speech. Should add something a little funny, a little amusing, so that people laugh, people are lighthearted, and you leave a good impression on the next person. So don't make, so, make it so serious. Say that, oh, I, I was such a fool this morning, I did this. Okay, so people laugh, hey, you're not a fool. Yeah, but you know, I did this, I made a made an idiot of myself and you're saying something a little bit funny so people laugh keep yourself equipped with a few jokes learn a few jokes so that when the going is slow you can step in and say by the way did you know this latest thing that came on whatsapp and you say it people laugh it eases the atmosphere people suddenly think hello she's so popular and Nupur is really popular she says she says wonderful things. She eases the atmosphere so much. So everybody should be armed with some jokes, some light anecdotes, which you can use. So do use humor whenever possible. And of course, smile. Don't be so serious, smile. And project. By projection, I mean Throw your voice. Don't internalize. When you internalize like I am doing, you will not be heard. Throw your voice <clears throat> so that you can be heard. So this is basically the list of words that you have, which will enhance your speech and communication and your diction. Remember that word projection. Projection is extremely important. You learn to throw your voice. So everything that I have given you, all these points are important points for diction, for communication skills. And I would like you to remember these points, jot them down, and try and use them as your little Bible. So now we are going to the next part of our project, which is are we are we on? Yes, Miss Martin, please. We can yes. move ahead. Thank you. Because I suddenly everything switched off. So it's going to be your clothes sense, your dress sense, which is very, very important. Because when, remember that first impressions are lasting impressions. So we're going to show you some pictures and see how you follow them and what you think of them. Because this is about uh, corporate dressing. The one thing that I want to show you first is, uh, of course, the first picture. This is very important, is the black and white combination, which is an excellent combination to have. 
This is one picture that I'm showing you, which is a global communication thing. And then I will tell you about your cologne, your deodorant, your eau de toilette, eau de parfum, all these difficult things, which I think you will be happier knowing. But take a look at this picture. And the people on the left hand side, this lady in the skirt, the jacket and the suit, and the gentleman in the suit, this suit and uh, the lady's uh, dress suit is completely formal. So remember one thing which most people are not aware of is that a skirt or a dress is far more formal than trousers. Which is something that most people find very surprising. For instance, when you are called to the Queen's party, you're not even allowed to think about trousers. No divided skirts, just regular skirts, a short skirt or a long skirt. So here you have a dark suit, which is a corporate formal suit. So remember a corporate formal suit for your husbands or boyfriends is a dark suit and only a white shirt. No colored shirt, no dots, no stripes, but a white shirt, a neat looking tie, and the cuffs that show beneath the jacket sleeves and polished black shoes. Socks that match your trousers and your belt, of course, should be there. And your tie should end at the tip of your buckle when you're standing up. This is just very, very general and very small little hints that I'm giving you so that you know when you work with your husbands and boyfriends, you can tell them a corporate occasion requires a dark suit, not a light khaki suit or a light gray suit, but a dark suit. So that's the essence of corporate dressing. And you see, you can wear a shalwar kameez, you can wear a sari. There's nothing like wearing a sari. The most beautiful garment in the world, I think, is a sari. Of course, if you have that, please wear that for a formal occasion. There's nothing like uh, a sari. So now I will first speak to you, since I've shown you this picture, about uh, the basics of your dressing. Before you start dressing, friends, you have to think about your daily shower, of course. You have to have a shower in the morning or afternoon or evening, or some people have two showers a day in the morning and in the evening. And with that, a very important thing is the use of deodorant. Now, a lot of people think that if they use cologne or toilet water, they are going to be fine. But a deodorant is a totally different ball game. Deodorant is an antiperspirant or a deodorant which you apply axilla area, your underarm area, so that you don't perspire, or rather your perspiration doesn't have an odor. So you apply it there, you can even apply it on the soles of your feet, <clears throat> because ladies, the soles of your feet perspire the most. There are 3,000 sweat glands on the soles of your feet. So a lot of people use deodorant on the soles of their feet. And I will tell you the deodorant to use. You're probably very happy at the end of the session to know about this deodorant. It's called the Crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L. And it's a natural deodorant, which is found from the, in the ground. You can get it on Amazon, I know. And you just wet it. You have to wet it because it's made of natural stuff. It's alum. And you rub it anywhere that you think you perspire. You have to wet it, dampen it, and apply it. And it's a really wonderful thing. It lasts for almost a year and a half. It's, it's superb. So please, before you dress, you have to have the deodorant. Needless to say, you have to have your manicure and your pedicure, clean nails, neat nails. And you have to keep your eau de toilette, eau de cologne, or eau de parfum. These are all French words, which actually mean 
cologne water or toilet water because that's what you spray after you dress so spray it all over underneath it you have your deodorant and of course you have your daily shower so you're completely neat when you present yourself to somebody I once had a client that was going to have was having had the uh, habit of having onions and garlic and then they had asked me to work with his client because he was with high-end uh, paying clients and he was people always complained about how he has to have pan and he used to have onions and, um, and and the garlic so please remember when you're going to a good a meeting where you're in touch with people at a close quarter do not have onions or garlic do not chew pan i'm sure none of you ladies will be chewing pan i don't think i can see you do that but this is just a little uh, hint that you can even spread to others that you should not be having that so here you are nice shower your or your eau de toilette or the cologne or deodorant and you are going out to a party. You are going out to a party, you're going out for a business occasion. How do you dress and how do you look? It, it's true clothes make it the man. Of course, make it the woman too. Basically, of course, once you open your mouth, people have to judge you for how you speak, but we've already done that. So you will hopefully be a good speaker and then you will look wonderful. So here goes, we're gonna show you a series of pictures, which I think you can identify with. Now a blazer is a very important garment, ladies. Ladies love to wear blazers. I, for instance, love to wear a blazer, a navy blue blazer with brass buttons. People have this false idea that a jacket is a blazer. That's not true. A blazer has to have metal buttons, either silver or brass or copper or some such steel or anything like that. So here you see a lady wearing a blazer and a gentleman wearing a blazer. Where do you wear blazers? You wear blazers when you go out to any occasion, a meeting, on a flight, wonderful garment to wear a blazer. And here are some very nice but brass buttons, there's the blazer with uh, the logo on it. So sometimes when you see school children having blazers, you have college students having blazers, have their own emblem, their own motto written on the pocket, their logos. Some companies have blazers and see the pocket square, which is kept sometimes in a triangle, sometimes like that in a and three in one, sometimes in a single line, sometimes a little V. So you have the pocket square. I have to tell you one thing that when a gentleman stands up, he buttons like this gentleman is but buttoning up his middle button. Only one button has to be buttoned. The rest, when you sit down, you open the button. Always open the button when you sit down. Close the button when you're standing up, the middle button, that's for men. And women, usually that doesn't go for, you can leave your jacket open. So here you have your blazers. Next, we are going to ladies office wear. Now, one thing people ask me is what do I wear in the office? Of course, what suits you? You know what suits you. I, for instance, know that jackets suit me. So I wear jackets and trousers or a jacket and skirt and I go for my workshops or wherever I have to. And I find that it's the easiest thing and the thing that I am most comfortable in. A lot of people are very comfortable in, in kind of desi outfits, like saris, but for instance, people are very comfortable in some people I know, shalwar kameez, or just what a lot of women wear nowadays are tops and tights, like a kameez and tights. They don't even want to wear the dupatta because if they feel the dupatta comes in the way. And that will show you some pictures later on. You can wear a dupatta and no dupatta depends on you and depends on where you are going also. Now here you have a number one, two, and three. The one big thing is when you go to office or when you're working, not to show too much skin. That is one thing which is a no-no not to wear long earrings, not to wear 
anything with too much zari or embroidery on it, not to wear shoes which have gold or silver embellishments on it. So ladies wear some simple leather shoes or a sandal or a nice looking chapel. You wear a suit, you wear a jacket, you wear a dress, you wear a sari, you wear a salwar kameez, you wear what you think you look good in. I see these three suits are totally presentable. You have a lady on the, in the, on the left hand side with a navy blue suit with a shirt inside. You can wear the collar inside or the collar outside. You can wear a t-shirt, you can wear an inner. And if you go to the news, again, you will see on the news, the newscaster is usually wearing a nice inner, a good jacket, and they're speaking to the audience. So remember one good place that you can go to is the news. And here you see on the right hand side, which is visible to you, whitish suit with a contrasting bag. People ask me, should the bag and shoes match? It's wonderful if you have a red bag and red shoes, they match and they look very good. But nowadays you don't really have to match it. It looks good when it's matched, but you can wear any shoe and any bag. Be careful that when you have a bag, try and see if you can get a bag with a little pocket on the where you can slip your cell phone in and when you go to the other side, have a little pocket where you can put your visiting cards. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to fish your visiting cards from the bottom of your handbag and take it out and show it to the, the person who's opposite you. So try and get a bag that has is a little bit organized. The most of the designer bags are not that organized. So when you go to an ordinary regular function, you don't really have to carry a designer bag. Try and get a more practical bag that has compartments where you can keep your different things. Of course, it's wonderful to wear an Hermes or a Ferragamo or a Dior or a Chanel, it's wonderful to do that, but then they're not very organized to tell you the truth. So here you finish with this picture, this basic picture, and we'll go to the next one. Right here, you have some more ladies office wear, and you have the scarf there, very good use of scarf. Remember, you can wear a scarf around your neck, like this woman's wearing or tucked into the jacket. And here you have a soldier woman. So she's also very comfortable in a jacket and a skirt, a jacket and trousers. And see the shirt is inside, the, co the collar is inside. And here is some ladies office wear. You have um, here we have some more ladies office wear. You have a longer jacket. Now when you have a tummy or you when you're a little bit bigger, you wear a longer jacket, don't wear a short jacket. A longer jacket hides things. So you wear that, you wear these closed heels which are shirt outside or top outside and not tucked in. So it looks really neat and <clears throat> presentable. Here again, you have a whole different look at things. You have a jacket, you have trousers, you have a sweater and top, like a twin set. All very neat and all very clean. You have a lot of ladies dress codes here. You have a long skirt, you have a short skirt, you have trousers, you have a three quarter skirt. All kinds of things are fine in the office going out to going out for meetings, as long as you're not showing too much skin. <clears throat> right, here we show the ladies dress codes. And we have the next one for you. We had a good look at the dress codes, and um, we want to have a quick look at the luxury labels. So here we have 
I'll quickly go through them with them. Uh, it's um, yeah, we, yeah, we have uh, cars and watches. Yeah, we have Audi. It's not Audi, but Audi. So you have Jaguar, you have Mercedes, you have Skoda, 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 Mont Blanc, Versace, Hugo Boss, Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton, Giordano, Tagoya, Le Cordon Bleu, which is the best school for cookery to learn how to be a good chef. Bulgari. Croissant. Nina Ricci. Chanel. Burberry. Roger Vivier. Bottega Veneta, Bottega Veneta, Dolce Gabbana, Audemars Piguet, Ralph Lauren, L'Oreal, Longines, Chopin, Ulysse Nardin, Christian Louboutin, Haute Couture, Davidoff, Gucci, Hermès, Lancôme, Lavin, Magnifique, Pierre Cardin, Richie Riquel, Salvatore Ferragamo. Yves Saint Laurent, Chic, Vogue, Frank Muir, Prêt à porter, Homme Femme, Giorgio Armani, Bourgeois, Patek Philippe. Chateau Mouton Rothschild, Sancerre, the Glen Livet. Thank you. So now you know what thank you is all about. Shino, you're on mute. Thank you, Ms. Merchant. Thank you so much for such a wonderful session. You know, we might have had to. The end. Shinu, over to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ms. Merchant, for this thoroughly edifying session. I'm sure all our members will have something to ameliorate from this pep talk. Moving on, we now open our session for a QA round. So, our first but I question. Want to ask you, uh, is that Shinu? Yes, ma'am. Yes, what I wanted to say is that it won't be possible for us to finish answering all the questions now. I'll answer up, you know, until when we have time. And then later, what you can do is to also send Siddhar some questions, which we can then tackle later on, and I can give you the answer to that afterwards. Uh, so, ma'am, can we just do a few of them right now? Yes, of course you can. Of course you yeah. can. Yeah, we uh, have a couple of people doing it. So, uh, our first question comes from Alpa, Alpa Jain Kapoor. Hi, Ms. Merchant. Thank you so much for your enlightening talk. Thank you. Ms. Merchant, Ms. Tell Merchant me. I'm, always, I'm always stuck in an awkward situation when someone compliments me. The only way I acknowledge is by a thank you or a, at the most I smile or compliment them back. Can you suggest me what is the right way of accepting a compliment? Uh, when somebody gives you a compliment, accept it with a plum. Now, what do I mean when I say a plum? Accept it with grace. Because somebody says, what a nice outfit you're wearing. Oh, thank you very much. And a little line about it saying, actually, my husband chose this for me. 
and he'd be so happy to hear that you you like it so much. So you mentioned that, or say, you know, sometimes when people compliment me, I have clothes in my wardrobe that are of many, many years old, and sometimes I wear them, and people say, oh, where did you get this lovely Chinese brocade jacket from? I say, you wouldn't believe it. Thank you very much for that compliment, but this is exactly about 40 years old. And it's so it's withstood the stare, you know, the test of time. So thank you so much for that lovely compliment. And sometimes you return a compliment. You say, oh, that's very kind of you and me. I also return the compliment by saying how well-dressed you are and what a beautiful necklace you're wearing. Oh, thank you very much. That was given to me by my husband just for my birthday. So she accepts it with a plum too. So you can say, just accept the compliment and say, thank you very much. Or you can also return the compliment and admire something about that person. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Merchant. Thank you so much. I hope I'll be prepared the next time anyone compliments me. Yes, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. so glad. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Merchant, thank you, Alpha. Ritika, can you please ask your question? Hello, Ms. Merchant. We are enjoying your session thoroughly. My question Good. is, American culture is laid back and easy breezy. Especially like, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Uh, can you hear it now? Better, yes. Okay. My question is, American culture is laid back and easy breezy. Why European and British culture is one of stiff upper lip and drenched in protocol. India, on the other hand, is caught between the two. Do you think convenience should override protocol and discipline in both fashion and also as a way of life? See, I am a person who is from the old school of thought. So I prefer the European culture, the culture that is slower, that is easier to understand and more acceptable to us here in India. But a good mix is also important. So you combine something from the old, old charm, like for instance, having candles at dinner time is, is very, very old world extremely wonderful to have. For instance, I tell you every night when I have dinner, I'm all on my own, especially during this time. And I've been on my own. My husband passed away some years ago. I light candles every time I have dinner because I respect my own space. I like to be with myself. It's just not for everybody else. So I am the European in that in that way, uh, more European than American. Americans are a little bit casual about life and they take life very easy. And they say, well, it's okay. But I find that even Americans today are waking, are more people, especially what I'm taking, I'm saying more than 40 plus or 50 plus, would be also very, uh, conducive to the old world charm. So somewhere in between, you have to hit it right. Like I have partly when I go to a quick party, when it's like a, a uh, an embassy party, for instance, a diplomatic thing, then I know it's going to be a little bit old world charm. Then I dress to suit that old world charm. And when I'm going to a younger mm -hmm. person's party, then I wear a, a bright dress or something which is more uh, more is sort of used to them and things like that. And uh, I move around faster from person to person at a cocktail party. If it's an old world place, then I sit sit more and I accept compliments. And it's a different kind of a, a look totally. But what is important for you today is to combine the two. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insight. Thank you, Mr. Rachita, can you please ask ma'am the next question? I think Rachita is uh, on. Can you move to the next one to Parul? Can I ask? Yes, please. Ma'am, I would like to know, suppose when we go to a formal Indian uh, dinner with the thali set out, then is it okay to eat with hands or like how do we how do we sort of uh, eat uh, with fork and spoon because it's a typical Indian thali setup. 
Is it okay if we eat with the, with hands? When it's a thali set up, when it's an Indian set up, let's get one thing uh, settled over here, which is a very important question you asked, because a lot of people get confused. I, I teach fine dining where you have forks and knives, and I do that just like this on a, on a Zoom call, or I do it like this. It's you, then you attempt by having your left, your a fork in your left hand and a knife in the right hand, and you put it in the middle of the plate, and the whole thing is a European style of eating. But let's get this uh, straight. An Indian style of eating has to be maintained with Indian thing. You you break the chapati with your hand. You take the right hand. You make the you 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 take the chapati in the right hand, and you can keep your fork in your left hand and spoon the chapati onto the fork and have it. If you need to use your fork and your hand for breaking the chapati, if it's a total thali dinner or a thali lunch, then you only have it with your fingers and you have the teaspoon for having your juice, your arm rice or your dal or your dahi curry or whatever it is, then you have the teaspoon. Mm -hmm. But otherwise you have it with your hand, but be careful to always ask the host, may I get up and wash my hands at the end of it? Or a very thoughtful host will even give you a finger bowl, which you will have at the right hand side to dip your fingers in and then wipe them on the napkin. So, so Indian style, Indian way, European style, European way. Thank you, thank you, madam. Thank you, that was rather useful. Parul, can you please? Yes, Parul, can you please come up with your question? Yeah, please go ahead, Parul. All of us are spellbound by this session and we're going to make the most of it. My question is, there are times when we are about to walk into an unknown societal gathering or amongst a new group of business associates. In this situation, can you give us a few tips to make a lasting first impression? Ma'am, could you hear the question? I think you're in Sabira Ji. Do you want to write write it out? Can she type it here? Ronita. Volume, yes. Where is the volume? Parul, do you want to say a question again? There is a problem with the volume. All right. I'll just repeat my question, Sabira, ma'am. No. Okay. no. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Parul, why don't you type out your question and uh, we will uh, take the next question till then from Rachita. That's a good idea. Yeah? Yes. Rachita, have you joined in? We go next with Gunjan. Gunjan, can you please put forth your question? Uh, hi, I would like to just... Thank you for such a learning uh, masterclass. I, it was really spellbound. Uh, going forward, my question is, as of today, all, all the Swiss finishing schools have shut down because of the feminist outcry against such a myopic training of women. I think all of the institute, except Villa Perfume, is the only one standing how important is it for women still to be trained on manners and etiquettes and what is the finishing school how relevant is it uh, still well a finishing school uh, this is gunjan's question right gunjan a finishing school is very important uh, but it was more important in the olden days where I was a young girl, say, and I went to a finishing school and that's why I was better equipped to face any occasion that I came across. But right now we have so much exposure all on your Google. You know how to eat with the fork and knife from there. You can see that. I mean, you won't 
probably enjoy it as much as a session where there's a, we are, we have an exchange, but you'll see things over there. You'll see how to dress over there. You'll see how to, um, how to eat fish, for instance, over there. They'll show you on, on, on the whole net. The net is so important and so information for you that that is why the finishing school was successful in the old days when I was, as I told you, a young girl. There was nothing like that. We didn't have any television. We only had the radio. So somebody had to demonstrate to us, somebody had to show us, somebody to teach us also how to cook. So we learned cooking, we learned sewing, I learned psychology, I learned good manners. We learned oh, so many wonderful things that it actually enriched enriches you and makes you a better person and a, more equipped to handle anything in life. So of course there is nothing or there was no finishing school. There are a few left, but now I'll tell you something. Most colleges and universities have as part of their curriculum, a little bit of a finishing thing at the end where they teach you how to dress, where they teach you how to eat properly, where they teach you how to face life and to meet people, to introduce people, and all these basically visiting. They do have it because they don't want their students to be only good as far as their studies go, but they want an or universities in the United States have a finishing thing at the end where you know how to dress and you are better equipped to handle life. Thank you, Ms. Merchant. Uh, Shweta, can you please come up now? Yeah. Hello, Sabira, ma'am. It has been wonderful Hi, listening to you. Uh, I wanted to ask you something. Of yes. all the Asian contestants you have trained so far, so who, according to you, already had the most star-like qualities and was the most articulate of them all, even at that nascent stage when you were molding them? And you always knew at a very early stage that she would go places like you have trained Diana Hedden, Lara Datta, Priyanka Chopra. So many come to my mind. Who among them has been your favorite as a student? Well, uh, I won't say anybody's my favorite because that would be an unfair thing for me to... Uh, but I will tell you who was the most... Uh, equipped, let's say, somebody who was really very articulate, yeah. good and very comfortable with people was Lara Datta. The moment, uh, I, and in those old days, we used to, I'm talking about 25 years ago, we used to have the training in a little school. Now the training has progressed so much. It's in a lovely five-star hotel and we get wonderful meals cooked by the chef for us and made to feel like a VIP. But in those days, was, there was no air conditioning. It was a little fan in the corner and we met in an, in an old school room. And that was where I trained Lara. And at the first moment when I trained her, she was, she spoke so well in a, a well-modulated tone and her introduction. I had asked her to write about herself on a piece of paper and then give the paper to me. And then I read it out. She'd also written it very well. So I would say, I mean, uh, Priyanka was a fantastic learner. She was very fast and she was, I, well, the hardest, uh, the person who worked the hardest, I would say, was Priyanka. I haven't seen anybody who had the capacity to work like she had. She was amazing as far as her work went. And Lara was fantastic the way she spoke and the way she held herself right from day one. Wow, you could predict that. And that is indeed fascinating. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> like to intervene and ask uh, on that point uh, you know in the last few years none of the miss indias have been able to make a much nationally or internationally in fact the last time i recall the names of all the contestants would be 2000 when you know lara priyanka and dia won after that it's i mean it's a blur uh, have you all at femina sat down and discussed what the unknown component uh, may be uh, for the reason behind this there is, uh, it's, it's like in anything in life, it's uh, cyclical. 
Uh, there was a cycle at that time when competitions were so popular and everybody thought, oh my, beauty competitions are big things. It was a bit, it was an uh, unbelievable affair to have that walk down the ramp and this, that and the other. But after a few years, everybody gets a little bit tired of that. And at the moment, they, they kind of, they're not so geared up for the competitions. They're not so much into competitions, mind you. At this moment, I am training a, a very beautiful girl called Adlin. You can look her up, Adlin Castellino. And there's something that I did recently on uh, Instagram, which I think I can even ask uh, Siddharth to send you to a beautiful discussion we had uh, with Adlin. I had with Adlin on Instagram about my life and she sort of interviewed me and I interviewed her. So they are again waking up to the fact that, hello, let's get back into the game. A world competition is important. But I think all over the world, uh, competitions have not been as important as they used to, I used to be in say 2000. In 2000, it was like the cusp. Everybody wanted it and it was great. It was very popular and, and everybody was kind of taken up with it. But now it's taken a little bit uh, of a rear seat. People are not so much into competitions now, but nevertheless, it is still important. We still have our Miss Universe. We still have our Miss World. And uh, it's challenging for the girls. They work very hard at it, let me tell you. you know, I'm sure, absolutely. You know, I was just trying to understand like, you know, why uh, probably India is not able to put out those Miss Worlds and Miss Universe as they used to back in the 2000s. Um, Shino, over to you, yes. whoever has a question. Yeah, I, I think uh, Arna is coming up next. The last question, the last question, thanks. Yeah, the last question, Arna. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, hi, ma'am. It has been a pleasure hearing you today. My question for you is, at a beauty pageant, questions are asked to the contestants in the pen penultimate round. One do or die question. You yourself once opined seven years back that one looks for an exceptionally stop in the tracks kind of beauty in Miss India, then why the apology of an intellectual testing throughout the process? Also in the final round, does that one answer really tip the scales? Yes, in the final round that one answer does tip the scale if there are the three contestants left at the end and you ask the question and the one contestant amongst those answers that question brilliantly, that person is chosen as the Miss Universe because her question was very well handled. Remember, you don't want just a beautiful girl. I once asked, once asked Julia Morley, who's in charge of the Miss World competition, and what do you look for? Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a girl who has to be the Miss World. She says, you know, Sabira, it is about beauty, isn't it? It's a beauty competition. I said, true, of course it is. She said, we are looking for the most beautiful girl. We will sacrifice on that half inch of height or that one inch of height, but we'll go for that exceptional beauty. But with the beauty, you have to have the brains as well. We want a combination of both. Think of the girl representing Miss World or Miss Universe, traveling all over the world, going from place to place, and not being able to field questions that the press throws at her, or like people like you would throw at her. She has to be completely adept, so smart and clever. So she has to be fantastic in the upper story. She has to be perfect. So you... You think beauty is important. Of course, beauty is the paramount feature, but with that, uh, together with that, the brains is very important. So you have a beauty with brains. This is what we are all for, and I'm sure you ladies are looking for the same. Thank you so much for your answer, ma'am. Thank you so much. My Thank pleasure for being so patient and for answering our questions we could probably go on and on and on but yeah time constraints are definitely there so I once again thank you for all your valuable inputs
And going ahead, I now invite our chairperson, Dr. R.T. Gupta, to present a green certificate to Ms. Merchant. Thank you, Ms. Merchant, for this wonderfully uh, done workshop. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate all what you've taught us today. Some of it seems basic, but I think a lot of us forget these basic things uh, as we grow older. Uh, a small memento from uh, Fiki Flow. At Flow, we do not believe in giving out mementos, but instead we plant a tree in your name in the Sundarban forest. And you can track this tree with a certificate number mentioned below. So uh, that's our way of appreciating uh, you and all you've done for us today. Thank you so much once again. I would now like to in uh, invite my senior vice chair, Kanika Ware, to please give the vote of thanks. Planting a tree. Good evening, everyone. I'm at a loss for words in the wake of your talk, ma'am. We all have collectively gained so much from these precious nuggets you have provided today. I have always regarded you as the ultimate authority on diction and etiquette, and to be able to meet you finally has been an honor. Please accept our sincere appreciation for the outstanding presentation you gave us today. Truly, style is a way to say when you have Without having to speak, I would graciously thank my chapter chair, Dr. Arti Gupta, and the event chair, Shinu Khandelwal, for organizing this event for us. My gratitude to our sponsors, Balenzia Socks, Loya Corp, and Art Dinox. Thank you, fellow Flow members, for joining in today. Thank you, and stay safe. Great. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, uh, we have some questions in the chat box, which we will send it over through Siddharth. All right, okay, absolutely no problem. Maybe once, once things are normal, we'll be able to visit you. That would be wonderful. I think a face-to-face -face conversation and a workshop would be much better. Of course, that would be really wonderful. We could really get together and meet and uh, interact and exchange far more. Yeah, it would have Thank been you. lovely. We could have it had an interactive session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Goodbye. And thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you.